if you define cowardice as running away at the first sign of danger, screaming and tripping and begging for mercy, then yes, Mr. Brave Man, I guess I'm a coward. A quote from Jack Handy. Solve the World, a fictional adventure told in 100 episodes. <laughs> Episode 84, Don't Scream. Wake up. Itch. Ignore it. Don't think about it. Wake up. Itch. Ignore it. Don't think about it. Wake up. Itch. Ignore it. Don't think about it. Wake up. Itch. Ignore it. Don't think about it. Wake up. Itch. Ignore it. Don't think about it. Wake up. Itch. Ignore it. Don't think about it. Wake up. Itch. Ignore it. Don't think about it. Wake up. Itch. Ignore it. Don't think about it. Wake up. Itch. Ignore it. Don't think about it. Wake up. Itch. Ignore it. Don't think about it. Wake up. Itch. Ignore it. Don't think about it. Wake up. Itch. Ignore it. Don't think about it. Wake up. Itch. Ignore it. Don't think about it. Wake up. 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 Itch. Ignore it. Ignore it. Don't think about it. Think about sleep. You're sleepy. Don't think about the hand or the wrist. It's not itchy. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. Jen began vigorously scratching her itchy hand. The alarm clock glared green at her in the otherwise dark bedroom. 2.47 a.m. Late early. Too early. Groggily and itchily, the one called Jenna staggered across to the bathroom. Gandalf, her faithful companion, liked to sleep in the master bedroom and apparently paid no attention to Jenna as she flicked the bathroom light on and stared at herself. It had been a while, nearly two weeks, since first receiving her new medication from Lenore. It had worked well, the basic sleep aid, up until now. Up until this moment. Now, this was the first night under the current medication that she awoke to the furious need to scratch herself. It was more than that, if she was being honest. The desire was for more than just scratching. Much more. This Jenna Finn stared at her reflection in the mirror. Worry masked her face. Worried that this was only the beginning. She could get through tonight, sure enough. Tonight wasn't going to be the problem. Now wasn't the problem. Jenna thought this even as her fingernails tore into her wrist in vertical slashes. Repeatedly. Look in that mirror. Who's looking back at you? Jenna Finn? Naime? Some orphan who happened to survive Anmo? Who is this? Is this Jennifer Dash? Is it? Really? And this hand? Is this the hand of Jen Free calling? Pied Piper was understood now. The witches and leprechauns and minotaurs, they all fit together nicely in the one collective story. The history of the world had a cohesive narrative. All the tales now have their own personal hook on the mantle to stand on. All of the stories make sense now. Except, where did this hand come from? Where did this hand come from? And when Jen 
had gone through the machine. That machine in Mecca. Threw it, and then she met herself in that room. And when she came out of it, she was back home. Well, back at Atticus's home. Back in Louisiana. And this hand, this hand, came with her. This new hand. This new hand. When Lilith Babbitt ascended, she fell right back down to Earth. The Piper didn't have a door to go through. That was all made up. An illusion to gather all the old ones to one place. That was Adam's gamble. To round up his sheep for the slaughter, all in one place. All in one convenient locale. One place for Leviathan to eat up. Good, fine. That was over now. But this hand. Take it off. Cut it off. Take it off. Cut it down. Extract it. Take it off. Cut it down. Extract it. Gandalf awoke, trotting past Jenna towards the front door. Has Nate's come? Gandalf certainly thinks so. Good. Nate's would be a welcome distraction tonight. Two insomniacs make for good friends. Nate's? Hey! I'm awake! You can come in! Jen called out. She paused, waiting to hear an answer. Nothing. Jen moseyed out of the bathroom, into the hallway, and turned towards the front door. Gandalf wagged his tail vigorously and stuck his long nose out at the doorknob, eagerly anticipating its opening, and with it his ritual pre-dawn stroll with Nate's downtown. Should Jenna call out Nate's name again? No. Something was off. Jen tiptoed to the front door. Slowly, she brought her eye up to the eye hole. She couldn't see anything. But it was dark out, so there wasn't much of seeing anything, or anyone. With her eyes still poking through the eye hole, Jen hit the front patio lights. (gasps) She was on the second story. Her landlords lived on the bottom. Sideways stairs led the way up to her front door, up from the open garage underneath. Jen could see, at least she believed she could see, for the slightest of moments. A shadow leaped down the stairs as the lights turned on. A shadow in all black. Someone was here. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Lock the door. That's the first thing. Jenna tried her best to twist the lock slowly so as not to bring any attention to it from the outside. Someone was snooping around. Maybe they're just local thieves, stealing stuff in the middle of the night from random flats. Maybe. Surely, turning the lights on would scare off the burglar. It's one thing to swipe in the dead of night when no one's looking. It'd take an armed robbery to break in now. This shadow seemed timid. Nothing to worry about, Jen whispered to herself. Nevertheless, maybe it was good to call backup. Go ahead, give Nate's a ring. Get him to share a cup of tea. Stand watch for a little bit. If someone is waiting in the shadows still, the appearance of a second person would have to scare them off for good, right? Jen started to scoot back to the bedroom, prepared to grab her phone. But wait, where's Gandalf? He was no longer beside her, sniffing and wagging his tail at the front door. Where was Gandalf? The instinct here was to call out for him, but something was stopping Jen from doing that. She was afraid of what hid in the dark night and she didn't want it to know where she was in the house. Still, this is silly. Jenna was blowing this out of proportion. It could have even been a drunkard staggering to the wrong home after a night of long boozing. Gandalf! Gandalf! Jen whispered louder than she would have wished. No response. Gandalf! Still, nothing. 
The only light in the house was the light peering out from her bathroom. Her bedroom, hallway, living room, kitchen, and unoccupied master bedroom all remained black as night. Slowly, robotically, Jen inched towards the back of the flat, towards the master bedroom. That's where Gandalf sleeps. Perhaps he's given up and retired himself to bed once more. To the bedroom. Jen leaned around the corner of the doorpost to sneak a glance in. Shaggy, big white Gandalf was, indeed, in the room. But he wasn't sleeping. He was breathing heavily, wagging his tail viciously and poking up his head towards the window. The window, just above the head of the bed, faced towards the front of the house. Directly outside that window was the base of the stairs leading up to the front door. Gandalf either heard or saw something in the window. This wasn't Nate's. The intruder, the invader, was still here. Jen fell to the ground. Instinct led her now. Say what you will about Jennifer Dash, she knows how to survive. Her intuitions kept her alive this long. On her belly, she crawled towards the window like a marine crunching under barbed wire. Finally, to the door, she pulled herself up just high enough to see. Ladder. The invader had a ladder, and the shadow was at its base. <coughs> that was enough for Gandalf. The gentle giant couldn't handle the tension. He erupted into barks. Run, Jen. Run. The invader climbed the ladder quickly. You could hear his clanking. The game was on. No more pretending. Jen sprinted out of the bedroom. She saw the shadow's frame as she bolted out of sight. He was climbing and now coming in. Jen ran to the kitchen, grabbed a long knife. Those were shots. He had shot bullets at her. This wasn't a burglary. This was a hit job. An assassination attempt and Jenna Finn just let her assassin into the house. Two options. Make a run for it, or hide in the house. The living room, adjacent to the kitchen, featured a long glass screen door leading to an outside porch. Jen could jump from the porch into the landlord's garden backyard. From there, she could scurry into the shadows until she felt safe. Or, she could hide somewhere inside the house, until she got the upper hand. Quick, make a decision. One, two, three, hide. There's a bottom cupboard Jen hadn't used. It's empty, perfect size for hiding a young woman in. Jen scrambled into it, knocking her knees together, scrunching into the tight space, knife drawn. She closed the door, and realized the horrible error of her decision. It was dark in here. She couldn't see anything. And where was Gandalf? Where's Gandalf? If he came in... If he came in here, he'd sniff her out, give away her position in a moment. This was the wrong decision. He's here. In the hallway in front of the kitchen, Jen tried to hold her breath. For a while... She couldn't hear any footsteps at all. Then, the front door being unlocked from the inside. Door open. Door close. Was it a trap? Was the shadow standing right in front of her cubby, just waiting for her to think it was safe? Where's Gandalf? Unbearable moments passed. No sound. Jen inclined her ears as much as humanly possible to hear anything. Footsteps? Shuffling? Breathing? Anything. She heard nothing. The flat 
silent, dead quiet. All through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. Finally, the anxiety to know got the best of Jen. She pushed the cabinet door slightly ajar, and as best she could, snuck a peek. Nothing. No shadow. She crawled out, jumpy, on edge, expecting the boogeyman to appear from out of the shadows at any moment. To her feet. Nothing. To the door. Nothing. Peer out the eye hole. Nothing. Look down the stairs. No ladder at the base. <sighs> Jen could breathe again. The ladder was gone. The ladder was gone. The intruder put the ladder up and had now taken it away. Slow sweep of the house. Careful not to turn any lights on. Don't want to attract attention. Just in case. But the ladder's gone. Maybe it was just a burglar after all. Nothing in the living room, the bathroom, Jen's bedroom is free of devils, all that's left is the master bedroom. Jen's stomach dropped before she even got there. She realized it a moment before she saw it, was able to put it together. When she did, when she stepped into that master bedroom, she saw and had to look away. Indeed, the intruder had come up into the room through the window which he'd lifted up. But on the floor, motionless, lying atop a lake of black, was Gandalf. The bastard had shot him. Shot poor Gandalf. He lie dead on the ground. A bullet through his heart. time to mourn. Atop the dead beast was a handwritten note. It was too dark to read. Jen swiped it and scurried to the light of the bathroom. There, she read it. Silent rolls of tears streaming down her delicate face. It read, Don't scream. If you do, you've murdered your landlords. Come outside now, and I won't kill you. Two options are presented to you. Obey, or disobey. Make a run for it, or give up. Jen ran to the front door, the eye hole. A man dressed in black with black pantyhose over his face. This was the intruder, showing his cards, waiting patiently. There was some peace in seeing him. Sure, an unknown, shady, dog-killing assassin is frightening in its own right. But he's only a man. He's not Piper. He's not some god or goddess with unlimited powers. He could be outmaneuvered, outran. This ends easy if you come with me. I won't hurt you, but if you do something stupid... Stupid is Jenna's middle name. She bolted for the back screen door, swooped the glass door open, ran to the second story porch, leaped over the railing, and landed hard on her feet and knees. Something hurt. She'd rolled her ankle, no doubt. But this was not the time. Suppressing the pain, Jennifer lunged through the garden, losing herself in its thick blossoms. She picked through a wood fence and found herself in another yard. Some cuts and go-arounds and Jenna was lost deep in the neighborhood. She found a tree overlooking a main street and climbed it. Jenna had outran the assassin. Who was he? What did he want? Why did he choose her? And, perhaps more importantly, who sent him? What Jenna wanted to do was to run to Nate's and Petra's apartment. Just wanted to stay with her friends. But could they be trusted? 
It was Nates that asked her to keep her front door unlocked at night, after all. He was the one who set up the whole system of taking Gandalf out at 2 a.m. Was this a long con? Did she really have friends here? At all? Who could Jen trust? This is Dante Stack, creator of Solve the World. Come interact. Talk back about this episode. Talk back about any episode, part four, part three, part two, part one. Just interact. Be a participant in the Solve the World universe. The Solververse. <laughs> or if you're more of the private soul, you could just tell me what you're thinking. Tell me your thoughts about it. You can always reach me at DanteStack at gmail.com. That's D-A-N-T-E-S-T-A-C-K. That's my personal email, so I will read it and I will get back to you if you write me. Or you could write a review on iTunes. That's super duper helpful, so I would love if you would do that. Or, or reach out on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash solve the world podcast. I'm there every day as well, so that's a good place to write to me and also to interact with other listeners. We also have a subreddit page that's great for asking questions on. Or perhaps my favorite way of seeing you guys interact with the show is reading your thoughts on blogs. Do an episode recap or an episode review on your blog. Uh, that sort of stuff really helps spread the footprint of Solve the World. It gets us further into the tentacles of the internet and help spread the word for the show. So it's helpful for us, helpful of getting the word out on Solve the World, and it's super fun for me to read. So please, please, please do one of those things, eh? You've come this far. Just go a little further. By the way, the sound effects and music used in this episode and every other episode can be found appropriately attributed on our show notes page at DanteStack.com. See ya. In the year of our Lord, 1808, a Newfoundland dog died. He was five years old when he took his last breath, and he died of rabies. We know all this because his owner happened to be the poet we know as Lord Byron. Grieved and unsure of how to pay tribute to his fallen friend, he created a monument to the dog, a final resting place in a graveyard. Lord Byron, being a poet, had the following poem inscribed on the dog's tomb. The following are Lord Byron's words. When some proud son of man returns to earth, unknown to glory but upheld by birth, the sculptor's art exhausts the pomp of woe, and storied urns record who rests below. When all is done, upon the tomb is seen, not what he was, but what he should have been. But the poor dog, in life the firmest friend, the first to welcome, foremost to defend, whose honest heart is still his master's own, who labors, fights, lives, breathes for him alone, unhonored falls, unnoticed all his worth, denied in heaven the soul he held on earth. While man, vain insect, hopes to be forgiven and claims himself a soul-exclusive heaven, 
O man, thou feeble tenant of an hour, debased by slavery or corrupt by power, who knows thee well must quit thee with disgust, degraded mass of animated dust. Thy love is lust, thy friendship all a cheat, thy tongue hypocrisy, thy heart deceit. By nature vile, ennobled but by name, each kindred brute might bid thee blush for shame. Ye, who behold, perchance, this simple urn, pass on. It honors none you wish to mourn. To mark a friend's remains, these stones arise. I never knew but one. And here he lies. To mark a friend's remains. These stones arise. I never knew but one. Boatswain's monument. Lord Byron's Newfoundland dog is larger than Lord Byron's tomb by quite some measure. <laughs>